Welcome back to Ten of Swords with Chapter 11. This is the halfway mark of this X-Men event of the year. We're looking at stasis today, and, and I'll have to say, uh, none of the outcome of this issue came as a surprise to me, which, you know, it makes this a little bit more predictable than some of the other issues that I've seen, so, you know, hopefully we'll get some more surprises along the way in the future. But the big reveal at the end of this book pretty predictable. Teeny Howard and Jonathan Hickman are writing, Pepe Larraz and Mahmoud Asrar are doing art, Clayton Cowles on letters, and Tom Muller on design. Uh, so lots of the white pages from the previous Ten of Swords books, they've talked about all of the different nations that make up Otherworld. And we see as we begin here, we're finally being able to get a glimpse of what this expanded universe looks like. Again, I like the art here quite a bit. The series has given them a chance to really build Otherworld. You know, as much as Otherworld really isn't my thing, I still like to see all of these nations taking shape physically before our eyes, you know, instead of just having a bunch of white pages talk about what they're like. And we open up and we see an emissary to Saturnine going from nation to nation, handing out invitations to all who want to watch this contest. We get to see the foul and fair courts in action here, and we're introduced to some new characters, uh, quite a few <laughs> new characters. We see some more set up, and then it finally gets around to the main storyline where Famine and Pestilence, they're here claiming the lands of Dryador at the court for the Kingdom of Ameth. And apparently, they're, they're saying, we have all of our swords, we're ready for battle against the mutants of Krakoa, where the gaze of Saturnine goes, through, through this, it, it, it's really cool. Like, it, it looks like we're looking into a scrying pole, looking down upon Apocalypse, uh, and we see a mirror image of both of these forces, 10 versus 10, ready to fight. And Apocalypse says, are you ready, my countrymen? Have you said your goodbyes before we proceed? Cable says, yikes, our goodbyes. Can't we maybe get a pep talk instead? Couldn't hurt. So we do see a bit of a pep talk here. He says, sword bearers, most of you are mutant. You have tasted the sweetness of immortality, an evolution of our people. Now we step into the other world where all realities are one. Your defeat will mean the death of Krakoa, the death of this earth and the death of you as you are now never to return. So when you draw your sword, you must not fight like a human who stands to lose a few years of toil, but like a mutant who stands to lose forever in paradise. For you do not, you will not be the first immortals I watch die. <laughs> that wasn't really much of a pep talk, in my opinion, but this is my favorite page from this book. Uh, just absolutely. Like I was saying, this, this mirror image of the sword bearers of Arako and Krakoa, we see this pond that they stand upon. This would be a really awesome poster or like a print to put on the wall. And we get a recap of the prophecies of the sword bearers of Arako. You know, of course, the, the bad guys, if, if you're on Krakoa's side, of course. Can't imagine many people <laughs> at this point siding with Ameth. I like this next scene with the Four Horsemen, and of course, this is a flashback of the past. All of this to come in the very short future here is. We see the children of Apocalypse talking about the blades that they are tasked with finding. And of course, War is not happy about having to eat her pride to, to go and ask Solemn, her husband's murderer, for his assistance in this fight against the mutants of Krakoa. I have waited thousands of years for this, Annihilation says, and you think I will allow pride to stand in my way? Bring me the blades, bring me their bearers, nothing else matters. And this was the moment I knew. I mean, I just looked at it and I was like, of course we know who Annihilation is behind the mask. So like I said, predictable, but we will get to that in just a little bit. So the next part is basically you know, we're seeing the 10 from the opposite side in Arako. They're coming together with their swords. And, you know, I feel like it's a, kind of another mirror image kind of moment with Red Root, you know, being the one who communicates with Arako. 
very much like Cypher is the go-between with Krakoa. And so this is interesting, you know, the, and the summoner pledges to unite the two islands. And as, as he says that, we physically see the island of Arako crying. Um, so in order, we see all of these champions come into the fold, uh, all of them, uh, all 10, Red Root, Summoner, Pog or Pog, uh, White Sword, Iska the Unbeaten, Death War, Solemn, Bay the Blood Moon, and of course, Annihilation, that makes 10 of these warriors. And this is another scene that I really love. Just this epic art is beautiful. We're, we're looking at another, you know, picture that would just make a freaking awesome print to put on the wall. You know, I'd love to own this. Kind of wish Marvel would kind of do more marketing of those kinds of things. I think they really sell well. Uh, but, you know, we, we know how great comic book companies are with marketing <laughs> these days. Not really great. And so we come to our Krakoan heroes. They're teleporting to Otherworld as they step into this circle of ten and they're, they're discussing how they need to stand on guard in this place. Because, of course, we don't know what Saturnine has up her sleeve. And I really like, this is my favorite part here, this favorite exchange between two characters. Uh, Apocalypse and Wolverine are talking here. And Apocalypse says, Saturnite doesn't have within her, you know, that common mutant thread that we all share. And Logan says, I'll tell you what joins us all. Everything dies if you can find out how to kill it. That was a very Logan moment. Really like that. And Saturnine comes in at that moment, telling Wolverine that she could kill him with a snap of her finger. And <laughs> it, all that makes me think is that, you know, she doesn't have any kind of positive intention whatsoever just to be entertained and maybe control things. And of course, if someone is so powerful that they can destroy Wolverine with just one snap of their finger, gosh, I mean... Look how easily Saturnine was fooled by the Braddock family. But so, so I guess everyone has a weakness, and I guess I guess that's hers. <laughs> so everyone retires to sleep for the night, and we get our second wave of tarot cards here, which is this is what I've been saying that I wanted in at least one more issue. So hopefully we're actually gonna get another set of these at the end. It seems like these creation, stasis, destruction issues are, are going to be where we see them. So everyone's retiring. Everyone gets a card. And of course, you know, this, this leads us to make a, a few more assumptions about the future of this event, what it means for each character. And unfortunately, Betsy Braddock gets the Nine of Swords. So this is a card that predicts a lot of nightmares, worry, and anxiety. And on the original card, it actually shows... Uh, you know, somebody staying up all night worrying with these swords on the wall, but this is very reminiscent of the Ten of Swords card itself, and it shows Betsy Braddock just shoved swords all in her body. So, you know, <laughs> things look bad for Betsy in the future. Um, the, this is the most interesting of these cards. It was Cypher getting the Two of Cups. So this is a card about marriage coming together of opposites. And of course, this... This is cool, you know, it, it feels like him and Warlock are going to be become one entity, in my opinion, you know. They're already kind of joined together, at least by the arm and the sword. I think maybe they'll possibly have to meld together, maybe to save Doug's life at some point in battle. <laughs> I like this. Gorgon gets his card and he immediately just throws it away and says, ridiculous. <laughs> um, Brian Braddock? He pulls the Knight of Pentacles, right? So this is about protection, caution, loyalty, and on, honestly, you know, it, it maybe just something on the surface though, not, not as complex as I'm kind of thinking because the white page actually just hints that it will be about the coming of wealth. And I get that because that's what the coins, the pentacles mean in tarot, um, but it, you know, it kind of cheapens the, the deal to me in just a little bit. So Magic, she gets the Page of Wands. She likes that a lot. You know, this card is uh, kind of a, a beginnings of ambition, you know, a spark of creativity, or or it could be acting impulsively. But, but once again, the White Page kind of points to this being a little bit different. It talks about uh, being clever or tricky, which honestly kind of sounds more like the Seven of Swords 
uh, card, you know, might be a better pick for Magic if, if that's what we're heading at in the white pages. Uh, but of course, it always kind of leads to lying as well. So, you know, what do I know? <laughs> we, we're, we're going to see the future of this unfold, and I, I guess I will know then once we get to that point. And Cable is pretty unthrilled about getting the full card. Of course, with this idea, you know, it, 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 people just assume that it, it's something it isn't. You know, the full card is actually, it's the start of the great adventure of life. Sometimes it means moving impulsively in the beginning, but this is the beginning of the hero's journey. Just like the greater arcana is, uh, can be symbolism toward one's own hero's journey. And of course, you know, Joseph Campbell's hero's journey as well. So I think this is gonna mean for Cable that he, he loses some of his innocence, but that he changes a lot in the course of the story. And <laughs> Wolverine gets the strength card. And this is really about, of course, inner strength of character, of will, of perseverance. And I could really see this being a good pick for him, uh, but I feel like I feel like these are prophecies in a sense because you know the last cards from Creation Number One they seem to point to events and not necessarily to kind of metaphors for these characters' lives. And I feel like in real life or just utilizing tarot. It's a, it's, a, it's a way to look at the symbolism in the cards and associate it with things that you're going through or could possibly go through as warnings or maybe, you know, uh, what you want to keep from happening in a negative way, all as metaphor. But of course, this story, it really seems like we're talking about prediction and uh, that sort of thing. And so we come to this card, <laughs> the last and final of these, oh, excuse me, after the, the, the death card, uh, Storm does draw the death card and, you know, something big is gonna happen with her because the, the card of death is actually about change, necessary changes. It can represent the death of the old self, but it's more like the phoenix rising from the ashes. It's a rebirth and a change that happens within. It's what it really represents. And like I was saying, we do come to that final card that Apocalypse draws. We don't see what he draws because he crumbles it up and he throws it away. And so he sets out Apocalypse to find Saturnine. And, you know, she is always showing her hyper inflated ego. And she's telling Apocalypse that even though he has tried to infiltrate her dominion over and over, that Apocalypse was only able to make it into the Citadel because she had allowed him in. Of course, he probably didn't like hearing that. <laughs> when, when we get down to it, they, they're, they're using this elevator and uh, it looks like they're going downward. And we finally see that Apocalypse has drawn the Lover's card and it's revealed almost instantaneously exactly who Annihilation is. His former lover, Genesis stands before him. His lost love is now his greatest enemy and foe. And what a fun way to end this book and see this reveal. Of course, it was expected from the beginning of this event, just like I felt it was an inevitable betrayal from my own perspective. He says, the violent horrors I would bring to my ancient enemy in the name of my eternal love. And now it seems they are one in the same. What a fitting end to today's read. So coming up as soon as possible, we're going to be talking about the rest of this event. I'm going to be rushing through some of these videos, maybe moving a little bit quicker, and I'd love for you to join me. Hit subscribe, join me for the rest of Ten of Swords. Not sure exactly how much time I'll have for after that. It may take a quick YouTube break, but please support your local comic shop. You are the gateway into comics.